Snowboarding started out as basically uh, a way to get down a big powdery face, you know? And then all of a sudden, uh, kids like myself and some others that were in the skateboarding and that kind of scene and style and tricks kind of adapted over into snowboarding. Right out of the gates, Jeff was a standout. Like, I mean, just that he pushed, he pushed the whole look and, and style and snowboarding and to a whole new level. And just from his attitude and, and the way he carried himself to the dreads to DJing and then on hill, obviously. Um, he was, you know, one of the first people to, to really bring that skate style into snowboarding. Um, there can be other people credited too, like Noah Salaznik and others, but yeah, he definitely pushed the limits and style went a long way. People were getting big errors, but they were traveling the pipe. Brushy actually brought it really high, above the lip and a half pipe. His, uh, the tricks he was doing were like skateboarding at the time, like lip tricks. He was doing airs to disaster and revert and stuff like that in the pipe. And Brushy really brought the tweak into it. Brushy just had a different style. He would just tweak more and he had his alley of threes that he would grab like mute stiffy and like poke him out and just thought differently. I thought he had, you know, more interesting to watch than like Terrier. I remember, yeah, I mean, I always watched him and I don't think it was ever like a, how, will I ever get there, you know what I mean? It was always just like, how? How can I do that? Because I have to, you know, I have to go as big as him. How do I do it? He really was the first one, like, to me that was in the pipe, like, busting, just really, I don't know, he had that whole like hip hop like kind of flow. It was kind of crazy. He was like kind of the first one doing that, it seemed like. And uh, yeah, just his style was like nobody else's, you know. In that old video, Chill, that is like that first Burton video, like Mike Jacoby's like, I think you got Brushy, this killer rapper dude. And it was like, from that day on, it was, he was like, he was the rap guy. At first, he just had like this weird, Tony Hawk, like, remember the old flop, like the face flop? He had that, but like to the extreme, like it was this big, long, like thing. And that just all of a sudden turned into dreadlocks at some point. And then, then he was the dreadlock dude. Like right at that time was NWA, Eazy, -E, like um, uh, Public Enemy was really, was really big. And, and Brush was the first guy who kind of like, you know, rolled with that. He'd always have his tongue out and he'd always have a runny nose. That was always a good, good signal for brush. I don't know what it was. Just always a snot running out of that kid's mouth. <laughs> brush would get you thinking about your facial expressions when you're in the air, you know? Just like, like some sort of crazy face while he's doing it. But what Jeff would do is like, you know, he'd come up and he'd look right at me. Throw a stale fish right into the lens and land it. And you're always concentrating on the landing. You're thinking about what you're doing. He didn't have to. It was just, he's like a cat. He knew where he was going to go. Whoop. Boom. Done. Everything he did, he did with just so much style from, you'd see him at the US Open, you'd go up and you're like, I'm buying that pant, I'm buying that jacket, and I wish I could buy that board. And it was, it was just crazy to look back and to think that he had that, that power or control over, over I think, style and, and the influence of, you know, kids or, or you know, us. Yeah, the first time I saw Brush, he was at McDonald's, and I was just like so geeked that he was sitting across from me eating fries, you know what I mean? I was just like, damn, that's Brushy. Yeah, he's totally chill. And it's amazing when you have somebody that you feel that way about when you meet them and they're actually cool, you know? It, yeah, he's like an all time favorite for me. For sure. I remember, uh, I don't know what it was, 87, 88, and I, I went to the U.S. Open. I was probably only 15 or 16, so I had to race in the juniors. My dad brought me there the first year. It was kind of new, okay. and, and uh, he harped on us for weeks and months uh -huh, or whatever, uh -huh. and for a long time. We caved in, and I took him down, and he did pretty well. And Bob calls me up and goes, this thing is really big, he goes. There's, there's people here from France and Japan, and I'm like, what, really? I totally blew it. I, I didn't do good at all, so practiced up for the next season, and then I came back. Maybe this was 88, and uh, I did the slalom, and 
and just went as fast as I can and I ended up winning by like eight seconds and uh, I remember Jake Burton was down there at the near the finish line and and he came up to me and shook my hand and stuff and that was kind of the beginning maybe like a year or the next season after that I was traveling around with the Burton team yeah brush was a local kid that um we'd see at Stratton and he'd come to the open and you know, you couldn't miss him. He just had so much style right from the beginning. And he went big, you know, and he went big sort of beyond his limits. And so there was, when you see Brush flying through the air, there was sort of this, well, is he going to land this or not? I don't mean that as a diss at all. I mean, the guy was incredible. And he just had a lot of style and attitude. And he had NWA <laughs> blaring out of his car, I think, all the time. And he was just, he just really made things fresh and had just a great spirit about him. The guys out west had half pipe and freestyle contests for probably a few years or more before we ever had any of that. We all just raced gates all the time on icy east coast slopes. We didn't have our first half pipe till like Tenney Mountain, New Hampshire in like 1987. The Tenney contest was like the first time that any of the people from around New England that had never, that had all, everyone had been doing the same thing, but we were all brought together in one place to see everyone else ride, be like, oh, okay, so this is what's going on in Vermont. I'm just in New Hampshire, I don't know what's going on. And you made all these friends. Andy and Jack Coughlin, um, Chris Carroll, Todd Richards showed up. Pff, might have been like six feet high at the most, but m mainly just banks. And it was really cool, because at the bottom they made like, it bowled out, so you could just come down, do your tricks, and then point it, kind of like a quarter pipe at the end. It was sick. I remember doing big old suitcase methods at the end. He just barreled straight down the middle of the pipe, hit the, uh, hit the cul-de-sac at the bottom and just boosted. So he popped out, you know, by that time, six or seven feet, which is pretty big, suitcase air, and landed it. That won the contest. That's all he needed to do. <laughs> Burton had the foresight to be like, okay, we're going to put some effort behind this kid. And next thing you know, Brush is traveling with the crew, and he's and he's with Craig and riding with Craig all the time. And just he just got better and better and better. And we we're like, holy shit, dude, this kid! Like, what happened? Like, he got really crazy good. And we we're like, wow, okay, well, we need to kind of step our shit up. There was a time when, when people wanted you to race and freestyle. There was a few guys like me, Craig, Terrier, who we just wanted to freestyle, you know? We just wanted to ride pipes and stuff. And there's actually a photo of me doing a method in the middle of a race course. I had to go through the race course just for overall points, so I just messed around. And for a while, they just kind of looked at us like we were the oddballs, you know? And then a few years after that, freestyle's the thing. There's certain people, I think, and he's one of them that literally dictated where sport could have gone or, or where it ended up. And, and just his style and attitude and keeping it fresh and fun and, and very kind of standoffish of the mainstream at the time really dictated where it, the sport was going. And is people like that that showed you can make a living and have fun and, and live your expression and dreams through the freestyle aspect and the racing doesn't need to be a part of it. It worked out for us. I think the popularity with the freestyle growing after just the first couple of years hooked us up and we got what we wanted, you know? No more racing. Hi, I'm Karen. I'm Jeff Brushy's mom. And I'm Bob, Jeff Brushy's dad. His mom was always on this side cheering for him. And yeah. I think she was the first snowboard mom. <laughs> I think she was like one of the first sort of snowboarding moms, but. He, you know, he ran the show. I mean, he was, he was funny. He, he called his own shots. Nobody was really telling Jeff what to do. And this is his old room. It was his cave. He had all of his bibs all the way around. A water bed he would not get rid of. I'm serious. <laughs> Pretty boring room with a lot of junk. Those, I believe, are Trevor Graves shots. And this was the first competition. This was 1990, this was 91 was the year I yes. believe he did the over cup, World overall World Cup, yeah. I was cleaning out that snowboard bench 
and I just happened to open the drawer to see what was in there. There was a hacky sack and a bag of dreads. <laughs> Honest to God, I will find those. I will find those for you. I went, Jeff, I have your dreads. <laughs> I did. I told him I had his dreads. He goes, nice. <laughs> Take them out for you. I, I don't know. I probably need to wash my hands after I do. I cut them, and years went by. Years. Here's the dreads, right? Nasty dreads, or natty dreads, whatever you want to call them. <laughs> and it took him a long time to get those perfect. The wall is his collection of stickers. I've changed a lot of things, but I will not change this wall till we move. I won't. It's got meaning. It's got it, you know, it's part of the house now. It's just in all his stuff has stayed where he has hung it. There's Craig Kelly on he idolized Craig, he really did. And there's Sean Palmer's balloon. And he just kept adding to it. You love McDonald's. Loved so that McDonald's. that that came from Japan, I think. Love McDonald's. But um, these are some of the checks. This I it, Nissan Snowboard Tour. Um, what position? I'm not sure because it doesn't have it on there. They stuck him on there, obviously. And this was in 1992 when he won the national, um, yeah, the, the national competition, and his prize was that truck. I'm assuming that these were first places because he won it overall. Unless no, so the thousand dollar ones could have been like second place, World Pro Snowboard Tour. Get twisted. That was fun. <laughs> 1998. It was fancy. It was tough for him because he was not really a competitor by nature. He was just almost too sensitive, too nice a guy. And I know like the Open was a really tough event for him. All of his friends were there. And he never won there. He never rode particularly well there. I think it was just too much. He'd get wrapped up in all the social stuff going on and everything. And, and a lot of people actually thought he was an arrogant person when because he wouldn't really you know sometimes acknowledge things but he was actually shy so that was a real misconception about him what we did was when he um, first started winning contests we basically said to him because he had been known to like I want to be a BMX biker you know all this and he did well with that but he never did any competitions so we said to him well you know that I mean we didn't have a whole ton of money at that time to send him all around the world but we said well you set some goals and when you achieve one you can go after another one so he started winning all these contests and and then when Burton picked him up obviously to me I mean if this was his calling this was his calling I mean he didn't have to become a doctor or a lawyer he was making more money than his teachers and I knew it was short-lived, but I knew he could take it far, too. But we're very proud of him. Yeah, it was really fun. I miss it, you know. I miss having Jeff here. I miss that. So we have to get him to move a little closer. Bring the kids. <laughs>
Sigboard, and Sigboards are really happening at the time, and but just this rainbow trout. Great board, I mean, it was super well made and designed and very light, you know, lighter than anything else that had been made at that point in time. And, um, and it was a great shape, and, and he was riding incredibly well, and it just reeked of him. And it, I know Vermont, it was, a, it was just a winning graphic, you know, stand out for sure. See, um, on the original, that's where my name was. Yeah, somebody did it up for me and sent it to me. That's the cool thing about Burton, all those little, they really do a good job at listening to the riders, and letting the riders take whatever ideas they have and scribble them on a napkin. And literally those ideas turn into product development. So if it's Brushy, I'm sure Brushy, you know, his first shape that he made, it's probably better for him to talk about his first board, but was entirely different than anything that Burton had put out before. Um, if you look at the shape, you know, very blunt, nose and tail, compared to like this year, you get more of a twin and uh, yeah, it's just breakthrough. 93 was when we went to the three hole, the 3D. So you had, you know, here in the five hole, you had limited stance options, and then a whole new ball game. And Jeff was a huge part of that with rider development. This is like my second snowboard I ever owned. First one didn't have metal edges, so this was kind of like the first real snowboard I had. I think I won the junior slalom on it when one at the U.S. Open. This, this Cruiser um, 86 here, Jeff later in 95 had, uh, had a pro model that was the same graphic, and then, uh, but it, it was more of a twin shape, you know, but it's awesome, definitely. An old one of my pro models and the board that we copied, the original. It was really probably one of my favorites. Jeff just kind of always figured out what was cool and his graphics were always like the hot shit for sure. My memories of Brush was like, you know, the first fish board that he had, which was just ridiculous. And then he came out with the, the graffiti art board and then uh, the dice board. And My very last board with Burton was the crap stable. And then I kept the, the gambling thing going with Ride. I always liked to gamble. I, I've always been in the playing poker and stuff. so. I think that has a lot to do with it too. But um, I just think a lot of people like that kind of vibe and I thought it would work cool on boards. Burton made this the board into a real craps table with sides and I was like, can I take the craps table? And I had this idea, got my buddy's bow ties and uh, it uh, ended up being a cool shot. It, this is like no Photoshop at all. That's like the, the actual dice. That shot's just a different shot of me somewhere in a half pipe, but uh, it looked so cool they made it into an ad. Knowing him that gambling his classic shots, like the ads of like, kind of like the Rat Pack around his board, and I'm a big gambler and he's a big gambler, and he'll get us into like some celebrity tournaments and stuff with like Phil Ivey, and it's dope because He's like, it's just to see him kind of like how he's moved on, he's like shooting photos, but still the same brush. And you know, you hear his voice and you're like, ah, and it's just, it kind of brings you back. Craps board is kind of like a, a foresight into like him being into gambling for the last, he's not like a heavy gambler. He's really smart with his money for sure. But um, he definitely enjoys going to the bright lights of Vegas and playing some cards. Rob Gracie, he used to shoot me a lot way back in the day. That's how we met. And he met this guy who had the contract with Hara's Casinos to shoot, to be the official photographers of the World Series of Poker. They took me on and I got the hang of it right off the bat and it was fun. I love poker, so you're around all the biggest poker guys around and checking them out, seeing what they do, shooting them. It was fun. I did that for a couple of years. And uh, this year, I actually didn't do it. Um, a little harder now with the little kids running around, but it, it was really cool. Here comes little mini brushy. Come here, mini brushy. Come here. Hello. Oh, you got boots on? Yes. Here, come over here and sit with me. Hey, Arabella, do you want a snowboard? Uh-huh. You do? Woo. How old, how old does she have to be to snowboard? I don't know. She has a snowboard. Yeah. She has a little one. But she was scared to stand on it in Tahoe. But she finally standed on it. And 
because I told her I'd give her candy and I wanted to take a photo. <laughs> right? Remember that? You stood on the snowboard and I gave you candy. This year you got to put the bindings on and go down the hill and fall and then I give you candy. Okay? Yeah, yeah, that's what happens. You fall. You, you got to fall to learn, right? Oh, you fell down. Yeah. Kind of like you were snowboarding, huh? Mm -hmm.